Just very briefly at the top, I did want to uh, uh, talk to a little bit about the Secretary's Day in Tunis, uh, where the United States and the government of Tunisia held their second strategic dialogue, during which uh, Foreign Minister Taib Bakush and Secretary of State John Kerry discussed uh, their mutual goal of expanding security, economic, and governance partnerships uh, between the United States and Tunisia. They discussed Tunisia's important economic reform agenda, uh, its commitment to its democratic ideals, and its efforts to address uh, the uh, ongoing security threats from terrorism. The minister and secretary endorsed the continuing role for civil society in Tunisia's political life, building on the work of the National Dialogue Quartet, which, as we all know, was recently recognized with the Nobel Peace Prize. And in Vienna this evening, uh, the secretary will hold bilateral meetings with Saudi Foreign Minister al Jubair, Turkish Foreign Minister Sunir Lioglu, as well as UN Special Envoy uh, for Syria, Staffan Di Mistura, to discuss the ongoing crisis in Syria in advance of tomorrow's larger uh, multilateral ministerial. Brad, you want to hit us off here? Um, yeah, I wanted to start with what seemed to be a confluence of events today uh, regarding the fight against the Islamic State. One, uh, your belief that you've killed uh, the militant known as Jihadi John, um, the retaking of Sin Sinjar, and then also some advance by Syrian rebels in the north of Syria. Uh, do you feel that you're starting to see uh, the benefits of what has been a somewhat maligned strategy to defeat the Islamic State? Well, um, thanks for the question. Uh, you know, you saw yesterday, or all of you watched, I hope, uh, the Secretary's speech uh, at the U.S. Institute for Peace, where he kind of laid out uh, the various components, all of which you all know very well, uh, so I won't go into them. Uh, but essentially, you know, it's a broad, uh, varied effort, uh, both to degrade and defeat ISIL uh, in Syria and in Iraq as well as uh, to bring about a pl political transition in Syria and end that conflict as well. Um, we recognize, and the Secretary spoke to the fact, that these efforts are mutually reinforcing. Uh, you know, the more progress we make on one, uh, the more likely we are to succeed on others. Uh, in respect, with respect to uh, the hit against, uh, or the strike, rather, against uh, Mohammed Mwazi, who's also known as Jihadi John, uh, you know, um, others have spoken to this. Uh, but uh, we don't have a confirmation yet. Uh, but as the secretary said uh, in Tunisia, you know, that uh, terrorists and Daesh need to know that uh, their days are numbered and that we're going to continue to take the fight to them. Uh, this guy, this person, was a brutal murderer. Uh, he uh, participated in the video showing the murders of U.S. journalist Stephen Sotloff and James Foley, U.S. aid worker Abdul Rahman Kasig. British aid workers David Haynes and Alan Hemming, Japanese journalist Kenji Goto, and a number of other hostages. Uh, so, of course, we're assessing the results of today's operation, or last night's operation, and as we get additional information, we'll provide uh, that for you. And you also spoke a little bit about, or you asked, rather, about uh, the Sinjar, uh, the effort to, uh, by Kurdish Peshmerga forces, to retake that, uh, that town from ISIL. Um, Again, all these elements fit together. I don't want to necessarily, uh, you know, because I, I don't want to say this is a, uh, a a confluence of events that shows that we're uh, that we're uh, making quick progress. But we are making progress. We're learning from what works and what doesn't work. Uh, we're uh, reorienting our efforts into what works. Uh, we've talked a lot about this over the last uh, several weeks, um, and you know, we are beginning to see some progress. Uh, but we always bear in mind the fact that this is a long haul, uh, that it's, you know, it's, we're looking at a long fight uh, to degrade and defeat ISIL. And, uh, and it's a fight that's going to be carried out most effectively, as you mentioned in your question, by those forces uh, on the ground, whether it's uh, Iraqi uh, Kurdish Peshmerga forces, Iraqi uh, other Iraqi forces, uh, or whether in northern Syria, uh, some of the different groups that are battling ISIL there. So much has been yep. made about uh, Sinjar its geographic position between Mosul right. and Raqqa. Raqqa. Um, how important is it to hold and even expand control over this area uh, so as to isolate the two from one another? Well, as you said, it's a vital supply line, uh, you know, and 
various uh, experts uh, far more knowledgeable than I am about this have, have cited that, that it, this is, you know, it's key to disrupt the logistics between uh, uh, that ISIL has been uh, counting on. It's a logistical route as well as line of communication for uh, DASH or ISIL. Um, you know, I think this is, without getting too operational or too into the weeds here, you know, this is part of efforts by Iraqi security forces uh, to pressure ISIL on multiple fronts. Uh, and we're going to, they're going to continue to do that. We're going to continue to support them, uh, both with equipment, supplies, uh, and uh, as well as uh, airstrikes. And then I just wanted to add yeah, one sure. last one back on, yeah, on um, Malawi. Um, there's been some comments even from family members of those who were, who were killed by him and even uh, the, the British opposition leader that, you know, we shouldn't really uh, get too excited about... Uh, killing essentially um uh, this this militant and you know a trial would have been preferable uh how do you respond to that do you think that was that's unrealistic or do you think that you too would have preferred that but you you couldn't do that or, or how, what's your response sure um well we have seen uh, you know obviously some of the comments by uh, the families of uh, uh some of his victims uh, we certainly are very respectful of their uh, opinions and their viewpoints uh you know, obviously, uh, you know, as many of them commented, this doesn't bring back their loved ones. Uh, all that said, uh, you know, we've been very clear that we're going to operate within the national security or in the national security interests of the United States. Uh, and part of that uh, involves uh, taking the fight to ISIL, where it uh, is operating, and trying to take out those key individuals uh, who... Uh, or within the, the ISIL's leadership. Uh, you know, I, I can't assess uh, where uh, Jihadi John or Mohammed Mwazi sat within the leadership, but he was certainly a very public face and, uh, and put himself out there to be the public face of this brutal organization. Uh, and as I said, we've been very clear that we're going to continue to, uh, uh, when we see have opportunities to take these people off the battlefield, we're going to do it. Mark, Please go ahead. What makes you think that the uh, benefits of drone strikes uh, that kill an individual outweigh the potential negative effects of uh, the use of drones, particularly in cases where they kill uh, innocents, including U.S. citizen Warren Weinstein this past January. What makes you think that the benefits that you are actually winning when you kill one person, uh, when the very way in which you're killing that person could simply engender more animus toward the United States? So that was, okay. You came at that from several different angles, which I, is fine. Um, uh, talking about the possible... Um, um, how do I want to put it? The, you know, the we, we obviously in any kind of a strike, airstrike uh, that we carry out, uh, we want to be very careful to minimize uh, civilian casualties, and we're very clear about that. And we make every effort our armed forces do. And certainly, uh, my colleagues over at Department of Defense can speak more uh, uh, fluently about that. Um, bearing that in mind, uh, as I said to Brad, you know, we're going to look at opportunities where we have to. Uh, as strategically and surgically as possible, uh, take some of these players off the battlefield. Uh, you know, we are, let's remember, our goal here is to defeat and destroy ISIL, and we're going to carry that out. We're, this is a, a broad coalition that we're part of, uh, but uh, that's going to involve taking these people's people off and key players off of the battlefield as we have these opportunities, but certainly bearing in mind that we need to minimize any uh, any civilian casualties on any end, or on two, either side? Two, two questions on that. I mean, one, yeah. you clearly cannot eliminate civilian casualties. The fact that a U.S. strike killed one of its own citizens accidentally this year shows that. Correct. Right? So the fundamental question is, you know, Rumsfeld once famously said, the question is, are you killing more terrorists, these are his words, than you're creating? And the, the question that I'm asking is, what makes the U.S. government 
convinced that it is advancing in its battle against ISIL by killing one individual when it is conceivable that by killing that person, you may spawn another dozen, half sure. dozen, however many other people who bear animus toward the yeah. United States. I mean, it's a fair question, Arshad. Um, uh, a couple of points to make. One is just, again, looking at this strategically, uh, this uh, individual was uh, a murderer. Uh, I mean, uh, he put himself out there as one, uh, a brutal murderer who killed U.S. citizens as well as uh, British citizens, Japanese citizens. Uh, these were aid workers. Uh, these were journalists. Uh, he carried out their deaths uh, on camera uh, for the world to see. Um, and we've been very clear that we're going to hold these individuals accountable. Now, to speak to your larger question, which is, you know, does this have a detrimental effect or does this attract more people to ISIL's cause? You know, that's something we're trying to address, uh, frankly, through the various lines of efforts uh, uh, that the coalition is carrying out against ISIL. And one of that is in, however you want to put it, the, the messaging front or the, uh, the battle for uh, hearts and minds, however you want to frame that debate. And that's something we're continuing uh, with our uh, coalition partners to address. Uh, you know, we believe and we believe it's apparent that ISIL has a pretty nihilistic uh, strategy or philosophy uh, that they're selling to uh, people, and not just within the region, but around the world. And we've got to work hard uh, to uh, counter that uh, philosophy in, in every way we can. Uh, but that's a different piece to this, and I understand how they're interconnected than what we're do talking about today, which is taking off, taking out uh, these senior leaders uh, and operators out of the battlefield. We've got to be able to do, to do both, uh, frankly. Mark, please. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. On Syria? Yeah, yeah please. Syria, were you on? Yeah. Uh, Iraq. So, okay. I wanted to ask about um, Operation Tidal Wave. Uh, the Secretary referenced this in, in the prepared remarks of his speech yesterday about increased efforts to strike ISIL's oil and gas revenue. And um, Colonel Steve Warren briefed about this earlier today. He said that uh, the decision was made to strike at infrastructure to do greater damage than in the past because mm -hmm. ISIS was repairing uh, damage from, from strikes against the oil facilities quickly, 24 hours, 48 hours. Right. I'm wondering, beyond that fact, the, the desire to do greater and more and longer term damage, what were the other factors that led to the decision to target the energy and, and gas facilities more intensely? Sure. Well, uh, obviously, my colleague Steve Warren is, uh, is uh, more knowledgeable about uh, the details of this operation. But we've long spoken about, uh, you know, the need to take out, uh, and in fact, one of our lines of effort is to take out the financing of ISIL. And I think that's in that, that realm that we need to cut off. I talked a little bit about with Brad as well as, you know, uh, uh, taking out its logistical network, mm -hmm. of which oil and gas is part of that, taking out its sources of funding, of which uh, oil and gas is part of that, taking out its infrastructure. Uh, you know, those are all elements, I think, of waging a successful campaign against ISIL, um, in addition to retaking territory and driving out, going after its senior leadership. Uh, I think they're all of a, of a single piece, if I could put it that I, way. I was just wondering, I mean, it's, yeah. you guys have been striking their facilities since Correct. the beginning. Um, and you escalated in October. Does it have anything to do with Russia entering the battlefield? I mean, like, why increase? No, but you've been watching sure. for a year the fact sure. that they could repair these, the damage from these strikes within 24 and 48 hours. And for a year, you've, I mean, as you've the, continued. Sure. As of the timing, Nicole, I would say, uh, and we've been, frankly, uh, pretty transparent about this, is, you know, in recent months and indeed weeks, we've been looking at how we can uh, um, uh, accelerate our efforts. Uh, and again, I spoke a little bit about that with Brad is, you know, what's working, what's not working. You know, we talked about the train and equip that we were doing in Syria. Well, that wasn't, frankly, uh, performing up to par. Uh, we were very honest in that assessment. And we talked about then we putting in special uh, soft forces uh, into Syria to help with targeting and, and putting more effort into that, uh, uh, that element uh, or line of effort. 
And again, similarly, I think we're looking at across the board, how can we effectively more, um, how can we effectively take the fight to ISIL? And one of those is increasing our uh, ability to strike their infrastructure. Okay. Please, correct. Uh, on, on Sanjar, uh, Mark, yeah, you sure. mentioned that uh, you're looking at what is working and what's not working. What do you think that worked very well in Sanjar? Because that was very quick and very fast. It, Sinjar is, in fact, a big city compared to Kobani, and it took like a few days to retake from ISIS. Uh, what is your assessment? What really worked very well there? Well, I think, um, frankly, again, without, uh, um, what's the word uh, I'm looking for, without uh, being too optimistic, because I don't think, you know, the fight is necessarily over, uh, but they have made tremendous progress uh, in the last 48 hours even. Uh, but it speaks to the fact that, you know, a coordinated effort uh, where we're providing airstrikes to a, a very capable, well-trained, and well-equipped force on the ground. And I'm, by this, I mean the uh, Kurdish Peshmerga, who are very well known to be that, um, that it can really um, overwhelm uh, ISIL and drive it out of its, some of its key strong, strongholds. And I think that Sinjar is or was considered to be a, a, a key stronghold for ISIL. Do you think that the, having your special forces on very close to the front lines on the Mount Sinjar uh, was also an, an add to the to the operation compared to the other operations. You had them only on the in Erbil maybe or in Baghdad, but this time you had them on the Mount Sinjar. Did, do you think that had an effect? Uh, well, uh, I'll let DOD speak to where they were operationally, but certainly I think that you know that's one element we've talked to this uh, before is uh, you know having those individuals on the ground to help uh, bring in close air support is okay. is. is yeah, it's constructive. Uh, so, uh, and since we're talking about Sinjar and the uh, Yazidi case, uh, uh, yesterday there was a press conference at the Holocaust uh, Museum. They have, uh, they published a, a report that they prepared on the uh, possible of the genocide. They actually called the genocide as an independent institution. And they called the United States government and the UN and uh, the uh, National Security Council, uh, the International Security Council, U.S. Security Council, to call the genocide and uh, work on that case. Uh, what is your response for that? And uh, I think uh, the, re the report was really shared with, with the high officials uh, in the administration and the Congress. Sure. Uh, well, we've seen the report uh, published by the Holocaust Museum, uh, which, as you know, includes a finding that ISIL committed genocide against the Yazidis uh, living in Niniwa, in August 2014. Um, broadly speaking, without getting into specifics, I think the world and we, the United States, are horrified and continue to be horrified by ISIL's uh, atrocities against the Yazidi people. Uh, at this point in time, though, we have not made a formal finding of genocide. Um, and I'm not going to get into the details of our internal discussions, but we certainly welcome the museum's report uh, we think it's an important piece of work. Uh, we thank them for their outstanding work in advancing the cause of atrocity prevention. But this doesn't, uh, you know, this doesn't, uh, it, it only adds, uh, I guess, to our efforts uh, to take the fight to ISIL, um, to defeat and destroy them, as I've talked about, to degrade their capabilities, because these people, such as the Yazidi, are under such constant and continuing threat uh, by ISIL. Um, you know, ISIL's atrocities against civilians in Iraq and Syria are well known. Um, and it's the reason why not just the United States, but indeed the region and the world is seized with, uh, with uh, defeating them. Right. Uh, one, one yeah, last please, go, go ahead, Brett. Uh, I mean, you said you're not going to get it. It's not about it. Genocide's not a, a policy decision. You said you wouldn't get into internal discussions, but you either think it's a genocide or you don't think it's a genocide, and you don't for a certain reason. Is that correct? Well, again, I'm not, you know, we are, um, we're looking at the report. Uh, we have not made that determination, um, but it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't change the calculus here, which is that, <laughs> regardless of whether, you know, we recognize mm -hmm. uh, the atrocities that have been committed against the Yazidi people, and we also recognize the absolute urgency in defeating ISI. Right. But why, why haven't you made that? I just, I'm just trying to get yeah, to sure. why you haven't made that deterrent. What, what was lacking that doesn't we're just, make this We're again, you know, um, <clears throat> we're continuing to have internal discussions about it, but, uh, 
Um, but I mean, are you gathering evidence to make a deter? I mean, I don't. I don't quite understand how it's a discussion sure. issue. I mean, it's not like should we do this or should we not? It's a genocide, but we don't really want to talk about. I mean, no, no, no. We're. What, I would just. What What are you missing? Sure. Is it? Are you missing evidence, or you just think it doesn't fulfill the criteria, or what? I, I would just say we're. You know, we're we're looking at the report that the Holocaust Museum has uh, has issued. Um, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, we haven't made a determination. That's, I'll leave it at there. I'm not going to try to characterize our internal discussions about it. Or yeah, a couple please. things about this. Just because you haven't made that determination doesn't preclude the possibility that you could, at some point, make such a determination, correct? Correct. And you are still weighing the evidence on this question, correct? I just say, yeah, we're still having, yes, we're still having internal discussions about it. But again, pivoting back to the point that's that's important here, which is whether that determination is eventually made or not, it doesn't deter us from the focus here, which is destroying, yeah. degrading ISIL. I, mean, I think the reason you get so many questions about this is that there's a history here over the State Department and one of your predecessors not playing straight with the question of whether or not a genocide had occurred and where the, the spokesperson at the time said that acts of genocide had been committed but would not say that genocide had been committed. Yeah. And it was, it, it has been viewed by historians as a transparent dodge, that phrasing, acts of genocide, and by the end of the day, Warren Christopher acknowledged that he would use the word genocide. So sure. I think the reason you get pressed on it is, is because people want to know whether it is the U.S. government's considered view that something is or is not genocide. And, and if I understand you correctly, you haven't made that determination and you're still considering Correct. that. Correct. We have not, we've not made a formal finding and, uh, of, of genocide. And you are still right. considering We're, that well, question? Well, I, yeah, you I'm keep not saying discussing, sure. which makes yeah. me think maybe you're not even considering it. Maybe that's appropriate given the facts, but you, you won't even say whether you're considering whether it's genocide? Well, I think we're, you know, we're continuing to have, you know, I'm not going to comment on on the, on the content of our internal discussions, but you know, we continue to discuss it. So the problem I have with this as well is that saying you're discussing it or considering it, in the end, may not mean anything. And I'll cite even more recent history, which was after uh, El Sisi came to power in Egypt. You said you were thinking about whether it was a coup or not, and then you just said, we've decided not to think about it anymore, and we won't say it was a coup or not a coup. So are you, could you conceivably decide this was not, not a genocide, but not necessarily a genocide, and you just won't decide I'm just if not, it's a genocide? We're just not in a position today to say that it was a genocide or well, not a genocide. What, what, when you are having these discussions, what are the, what are the criteria you are weighing? What are the criteria that we're weighing? Yeah, I don't quite understand the whole. I mean, it's been a year. Uh, as you said, their atrocities are well known. The level, the scope, uh, the direction. What What is it that you need? What, what do these discussions talk about? Is it about strategic timing of a release of announcement that it was a genocide? Or, uh, I, I, I mean, I don't get it, frankly. I, I, I... Anyway, I, you know, your, your, your questions are, are all uh, well-founded. Uh, I'm just not going to get into the details of the internal discussions that we're having. You, you, just to be clear, you haven't even said whether you're considering whether it's genocide. You're just still talking about stuff, right? <laughs> um, well, again, we're, I, I just, you know, the Holocaust Museum put out their report. We accept that. We think it's an important piece of work. We're, we're looking at it, uh, studying it closely. Um, we have not made that determination yet, uh, but again, I think it's important to not lose sight of the basic fact or the fundamental fact, you know, and frankly, this happened last year, you know, in August 2014 when President Obama, you know, uh, authorized military humanitarian assistance uh, to save the Iraqi Yazidis who were trapped on Mount Sinjar, and, and that support for the Yazidi people continues as we take the fight to ISIL. Can I just uh, follow yes, more on that? Uh, the, beside the administration, there's also three resolutions at the Congress about the same issue, and they are discussing the, the possible of the genocide. Right. Uh, have you ever shown any kind of a support for their resolution or objection? 
that you don't want a Congress to call this a genocide or you, anything. You're talking about uh, the Yazidi relations with the, the, the with Congress? Yeah. Right, the Yazidi, right, there are three resolutions about that. Um, I, I'm not privy to some of the discussions I mean the we've had on the Hill, um, right. and you know, but we consult with Congress, obviously, uh, as they uh, need us to consult with them, and uh, we're certainly engaged with them as they look at all these issues. Just one more. Please on this uh, in the back. Do you have any update on uh, President Putin's uh, statement saying that he's ready to work with the U.S. to defeat ISIS. And he's ready to? I, I didn't hear the last part. His, his statement that he's ready to work with the U.S. to defeat ISIS. Um, you know, uh, without having seen the statement uh, itself, uh, you know, we've said all along that we would welcome uh, Russia's uh, constructive role in taking the fight to ISIL. Uh, up to this juncture, we've not seen that and some of their targeting. Uh, but certainly, you know, uh, President Putin's words uh, taken at face value are important, uh, but we'd like to see that uh, carried out through action. So Please, you, in the back. Um, oh, go ahead. Finish up, Tijan. So, so you, you, you are saying that Russians are targeting uh, people or the well, We've talked about this at length over the last yeah. uh, you know, several weeks, which is that you know, we've seen uh, the majority, and I don't have the latest yeah. uh, uh, numbers or statistics in front of me, but you know, the majority of airstrikes they've carried out have been against uh, Syrian opposition forces in support of uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad and not against uh, ISIL necessarily. In the back, please. Um, uh, can, we switch, guys... can we switch away from Syria? Good. I... All right. Um, regarding the charges brought against two relatives of President Maduro's, uh, two relatives of President Maduro um, on drug trafficking, I was wondering if you guys have received any uh, notification from the Venezuelan government, any, uh, I don't know, condemning the fact that they claim they had diplomatic immunity, however, they were charged here in the U.S. Now, I understand it was an operative of the DEA and that the investigation is with the Department of Justice, but wouldn't this question of the diplomatic immunity deal with you guys? Have you received any comments from the Venezuelan government? Um, sure. You're talking about, uh, just so I'm clear, the um, relatives of the the indictments of uh, exactly. Antonio Campo Flores and exactly. Francisco Flores de Fritas. Fritas, yes. is that right? Yes, Fritas, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, first of all, their indictments are a matter of public record. Uh, and upon their detention and arrival in New York City, U.S. law enforcement uh, authorities contacted the Venezuelan consulate uh, per as per normal practice. Uh, the Venezuelan consul general uh, has been in further communication with our law enforcement officials. And I would defer you to... Uh, uh, the Department of Justice uh, for more information on the matter. You asked a specific question about their diplomatic immunity? Yeah, exactly. At the moment of their arrest, they said they had diplomatic immunity, however. That's not our understanding. Uh, we don't believe these individuals have diplomatic immunity. Perfect. Um, Please. One sir. question on the diplomacy regarding this. Yeah. Um, did the U.S. government, other than consular notification, did the U.S. government contact the Venezuelan government regarding the arrests? Uh, good question. I do not know the answer to that, uh, other than obviously, as you said, consular notification. Um, you're asking whether we, or whether we gave them a heads up. No, uh, well, or, not to be precise, not a heads up, which would imply that you did it right. before the arrest, which right. I don't think U.S. law enforcement would do. But uh, it's my understanding that a senior U.S. government official contacted the Venezuelan government on Wednesday. Yeah. The day after the after the okay I, I'm sorry I misunderstood and, what you were asking and and the then the second question related to that is did you you know there have been there's been commentary in Venezuela and elsewhere suggesting that this was an effort to tarnish uh, Maduro's government ahead of their elections and uh, it's my understanding that at least one of the purposes of the call was to explain that this was a strictly law enforcement matter and not any kind of a an effort to interfere in Venezuela's election or anything else. Yeah. So have you tried to convey that message to the Venezuelans with whom um, you've been trying to initiate a dialogue? So I, I, I'm not aware of the call. Mm -hmm. I can take that question, try to confirm it for you. Um, but, uh, you know, I would obviously uh, dispel uh, that idea uh, here from the podium. Uh, this was strictly a law enforcement matter and had nothing to do with the politics of Venezuela. Um, as we've said multiple times, from this podium and elsewhere, uh, you know, we're, we're, we don't want to interfere with the internal politics of Venezuela. Mark, can I just ask? Yeah. On Sorry. diplomatic um, immunity, 
Who does it apply to beyond diplomats? Anybody? Like the family of the extended family or the godson of a president doesn't seem likely, but I just would like to know. It's 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 a very complicated, and frankly, I'm not a legal expert on it. Uh, we do have folks here who do look at all this stuff and vet it. Um, so I'm wary of wading too far into it, but obviously it, it, it is um, uh, those uh, diplomats and their families, immediate <clears throat> families, who are uh, registered here within the embassies uh, okay. uh, in Washington. Now, that doesn't necessarily apply to, as I understand it, the family of, uh, say, uh, consul generals and consulates uh, elsewhere in the United States. Okay. Uh, so it's a little bit. Is it, so it's a it's a little There's bit a of a, a nuanced distinction. Um, but uh, you know, we uh, <coughs> obviously um, uh, we vet these and look at them very closely with folks who understand all the the legal aspects of it. But I I, I can get more information for you That's offline good. if That's we good. need to. You and then back. Yeah. Um, Please, sir. Do you yeah. have any comment on Ukraine uh, Ukrainian lawmakers yesterday passing an amendment to the labor code that would uh, ban? employment discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. And then as a follow-up to that, do you think that this move will further reduce Russia's sphere of influence in Ukraine and other former Soviet republics in terms of propaganda laws and other anti-LGBT measures we've seen sure. in the region recently? Well, we are aware, and obviously uh, we commend uh, the Ukrainian Rada uh, for passing legislation that bans discrimination against LGB LGBTI uh, persons in the workplace. Uh, this was part of a series of bills uh, that was passed in support of Ukraine's uh, efforts to comply with the EU's uh, visa liberalization requirements. Uh, we welcome the, the addition of these protections uh, to the current labor code uh, and urge the quick integration of these measures into the draft version of the new labor code uh, that is under consideration in the RADA as part of its commitment uh, to international human rights standards. Um, you know, we obviously uh, we continue to stand with Ukraine as it uh, presses forward on critical reforms uh, such as these, and we want to see Ukraine continue to demonstrate its strong commitment uh, to European values and to protecting its citizens uh, and defending human rights of all of its citizens. Um, as to your uh, second question, uh, you know, this is about Ukraine deciding, uh, the Ukraine government and the Ukrainian people deciding uh, that they want a closer relationship uh, with Europe. It shouldn't be a zero-sum game. We've said this all along, uh, but they clearly want uh, closer ties with Europe. They want uh, more democratic values and standards in their own country, and they're pursuing those, and we certainly support them in that process. And as a quick follow-up to yeah, that, please. Do, you know, um, do you know if it, the U.S. Embassy in Kiev had any specific role working with the advocates pushing this proposed um, proposal forward? Sure. I mean, I can't, you know, beyond the fact that we, you know, our embassies around the world, but certainly in Kiev, uh, uh, have close contacts and close relationship with civil society uh, in Ukraine, and uh, and are certainly uh, offering whatever expertise and advice that we can we can on some of these issues. Please on Turkey and G20. Yeah, uh, uh, is there any way you can tell us what would be the ideal outcome for the U.S. side in terms of Syrian situation there? Uh, things that is there a specific uh, plan or strategy you have in your mind? when you're talking to Turks or other people. Sure. Alliance. I refer you to the Secretary's speech uh, yesterday yes. at the U.S. Institute for Peace. I'm slightly joking, but but seriously, he laid out our strategy. And among which, and actually, um, I think uh, Josh Ernest over at the White House spoke to the fact that, you know, certainly, uh, you know, coming out of Vienna, uh, hopefully the Secretary will be able to report on progress that's been made uh, in our pursuit of this dual track. But, uh, uh, more importantly, that's political process or political transition uh, that we're looking to put in pro put in play or put in process um, uh, uh, to lead to a political transition uh, in Syria. Um, the other really pressing need that will be discussed at the G20, and the Secretary spoke a little bit about our efforts, uh, is to address the humanitarian crisis that all this conflict in Syria has wrought. Uh, you know, the refugee crisis that now is reaching into Europe, but certainly countries like Turkey, Jordan, and others, Lebanon, as well, have been dealing with for years, as well as this crisis within uh, Syria itself. And so how can all the nations of the G20 pull together to address this crisis, ongoing crisis? Uh, I, you know, even in our, our most optimistic days, I think none of us see this as uh, the, the conflict in Syria ending any day soon. And we're certainly going to be dealing with 
uh, internally displaced as well as externally displaced people uh, going forward for uh, a long time to come. So we need to all do our utmost to, to address uh, their needs. Please, sir. Hey, well, since the G20 is going to be in Turkey, uh, is there any thought to uh, any inclusion in the statement uh, concerning freedom of the press? Uh, I, I can't speak to what may or may not go into the statement. Um, you know, that's obviously something that we, uh, a principle, if I could put it that way, that we always uh, value. And well, you, uh, yeah, you just I mean, did, you just said you're gonna. It's a major focus will be on the things that are negatively affecting Turkey, like the humanitarian crisis. Right. I was speaking about Syria and the, and the right. overflow of refugees, but you're talking about freedom of the press now in Turkey. Or no, in, freedom of the press anywhere. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm totally uh, is misunderstood. That be in, is, that, is that going to be referenced in any way at the summit, fundamental freedoms, including freedom of the press, given um, your criticism sure. of Turkey recently and actually long term for its freedom of the press? Uh, well, uh, second part of your question first, you know, we continue to have discussions all the time with Turkey, uh, and we're very public in our, uh, viewpoint, uh, that we want to see, uh, and urge the Turkish authorities to ensure their actions uphold universal, uh, democratic values. And that includes freedom of the press. Uh, I can't speak to whether, uh, or what is going to actually be contained in the final statement for coming out of the G20, but, you know, we consider... Uh, freedom of the press, broadly speaking, to be one of the fundamental rights uh, around the world. Same question, Mark. Yes. Uh, on the G20, in, uh, on the press, uh, uh, even for this summit, worldwide summit, there will be media from Turkey being excluded to follow the event. So uh, how, how do you handle such a challenge that you are going to a country and going to speak to people and the press, but part of the press, opposition press, will not be there. And as you know, uh, uh, the bigger part of the opposition media in Turkey under the crackdown, it looks like increasing since the elections. Well, a um, couple of points. Uh, you know, we've said this before, but I'll say it again. We're concerned by a troubling pattern in Turkey of uh, targeting media outlets and their organizations uh, that are critical of the government. Uh, and in a democratic society, critical opinions should be encouraged, not silenced. Um, you know, look at this room right now or on any given day is, you know, we get a wide swath of opinions uh, and, uh, and questions from all sides. And, uh, you know, we take seriously all of their viewpoints of the journalists in the room and try to answer their questions as best we can. That's part of a democratic society and it's part of uh, any government's responsibility. Uh, you know. Uh, just to pivot back to what I said to Brad, you know, we want to see uh, and urge Turkish authorities to uphold uh, democratic values that are enshrined in Turkey's constitution. Since many of the Western leaders will be also in Antalya and speaking to Turkish leaders, uh, would you uh, call on your allies, especially Western allies who claim to uh, value the universal values, uh, should they raise these issues when they talk to their uh, Turkish country. Many of our Turkey. Western allies don't need us necessarily to call on them to, to, to raise these issues. They raise them themselves. Uh, you know, many of our democratic uh, allies around the world uh, will raise these, these issues. But NATO is, or you know, Turkey is a valued partner. It's a NATO ally. It's a, a, a long-standing democracy. We want to see it live up to its uh, democratic values. Final question: yes, Will the U.S. president? raise these issues when he's in Turkey? I would not attempt to preview what the president may or may not raise in his meetings in Turkey, uh, simply to say that, you know, uh, human rights issues, fundamental freedom issues uh, are always on the agenda and always possible for discussion. Please, in the back. Can I ask about the China, South China Sea? No, Turkey. Let's stay on Turkey and then I swear I'll get back to you. Okay, apologize. We just want to finish out there. Just a quick clarification. Are you asking the Turk Turkish government uh, from this podium, or have you reached out to them after the, you, you know, the events when the a TV station was, you know, raided and you know the opposition's uh, media is being, you know, I, I just say we, you know, uh, whether it's uh, within our dealings with, or with with uh, within our dealings with the or conversations rather with the Turkish uh, government uh, through our embassy um, in Ankara, um, we convey these same. Uh, messages uh, 
uh, that we convey from the podium. So I would say it's a dual tracked approach. Turkey, <laughs> Turkey, Turkey. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and Turkey, Turkey. And yeah, then, sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mark, since th this is the Tur Turkish government is preparing that the areas for uh, the G20, and it seems that uh, also United States is just so focusing on the G20 and nothing else in Turkey because there's a conflict in in Silvan for seven oh, more than seven days. Like it's been eight days. Uh, it's been curfew and. Uh, uh, conflict, fighting, killing civilians, all and media completely banned from those those uh, uh, conflict areas in the southeast of Turkey. So there's nothing, no statement, no word from the United States government what's going on there. And I, it, uh, I, there, there, there were some sure. pictures by some leaked I, uh, from there that it showed that it is, it, it was, well, we, seemed like, a, like Syria, not Well, not we Turkey. are aware uh, uh, about the, uh, and have seen reports of the curfews, about the curfews uh, in effect in, uh, in uh, Diyarbakar, which is in the Sylvian area. Um, you know, we understand that Turkey needs to take security measures, uh, but it should also take all feasible precautions uh, to protect civilians and act consistently with its legal obligations. Um, you know, as to the specifics about the curfews, I'd refer you to the Turkish authorities. Uh, do you have any any way any any mechanism? In, you have your diplomats there, but it, is there any way that the United States government can make sure that there were no war crimes uh, conducted in those places? Uh, no, what war crimes within in in in, in the conflict areas by Turkish uh, forces or by by guerrillas, whatever? But do you have any way that to confirm there were no war war crimes? Any kind of a targeting civilian um, uh, what, what what do you how can you sure confirm uh, if you know, I, I don't know specifically if we have eyes on the ground in uh, in the Sylvan area um, uh, you know uh, and and I'm not going to address your questions about whether there's war crimes or anything like that uh, you know this is obviously uh, Turkish security forces operating uh, in the interest of their national security um, they have a right to defend themselves against and the country and, the, and Turkish citizens against uh, violence that's carried out by the PKK. Our concern is that they take um, in conducting these security measures uh, into full consideration and take every feasible precaution to avoid uh, hurting, injuring civilians uh, and act consistently with their legal, legal obligations. Turkey, please, please in the back, Turkey. Yeah, yeah, today, yeah. Um uh, thanks. You, today, the State Department designated an individual uh, which was arrested in Turkey last July and which was sentenced by the Turkish court to... What, what's the name? Uh, uh, Mak Makmudet Abdurakmanov. Mak Makhomet Abdurakmanov. Yeah. And uh, I'm I'm wondering, you were involved with the arrest of these people, this in, in this this individual. You're in too Turkey? far away from me. I can't hear you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just... <laughs> were the U.S. in... in U.S. officials, law enforcement in Turkey, involved oh, with, the, Thank you. with the arrest of this individual in Turkey? Um, I'll take the question. I'm not sure if we were involved in his uh, arrest, uh, but I can take the question and find out what I can tell and you. I'm wondering, what is the consequence of this designation? Because, you know, he's in jail, and he will be staying in jail at least for a couple of years. I don't know. The, the sentence is seven years in hell, but probably he will, he will be free after five years. And he was accused, by the way, of beheading of three individuals. So you can beheat three people and, I don't know, uh, you, can, you can be a member of the terrorist organization and you can be free in five years, maybe. This is your concern? Why you, why you made this announcement? Why, what is the consequence of this designation? Of his designation? Yes. He's um, in jail. Sure. I mean, and, and that's a good thing. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I can't speak. I can try to get you more information about uh, the designation itself and what it entails. Um, but, you know, broadly speaking, these designations are, frankly, to identify these individuals, to cut off uh, any ways to finance their operations or, uh, or any actions they may continue to take, even from prison, uh, to uh, conduct terrorist activities. Uh, and it's a way to freeze assets, uh, to reach out and to really uh, clamp down, if you will, on the financing of uh, terrorist operations. If at some point he will be free, you will have an extradition request from Turkey? Uh, we don't talk about extradition requests. Uh, Mark, as far as uh, this meeting of G20 in Turkey is concerned, they're also going to, is uh, the issues include IMF reforms and also corruption around the globe. 
My question is, as far as, far as I am for inform, what reforms are you talking about? And second, as far as the corruption is concerned, is this going to be an issue discussed, which I have been asking black market money from the corrupt politicians in, from around the globe, including from India? Uh, how, what U.S. is doing now to curb all sure. those black market money? Corruption, um, Goyal, uh, so I'd refer you to, you know, the White House, who will give uh, uh, background briefings about the goals and the agenda for the G20. Um, speaking more broadly about corruption or, or to your question about corruption, you know, it's it's not just a, a scourge in specific places. It's a worldwide and global problem. And certainly every democracy and every democracy that wants to be uh, economically prosperous uh, and a place where investors seek to invest uh, has to have uh, zero tolerance for corruption. Uh, it is uh, uh, it is insidious and it uh, creates climates where, uh, frankly, foreign investors don't want to uh, place their money or invest their money in. Please, oh, let's get to the South China Sea. <laughs> That's okay. I didn't forget. Okay. Yesterday, the Department of Defense verified that there was a flight operation conducted in South China Sea airspace. Uh, Susan Rice also said yesterday that South China Sea issue will be the central issue of discussion in President Obama's upcoming Asia visit. But China said it shouldn't have to have any discussion of South China Sea in APEC meetings. From U.S. side, would you have any response to that in terms of reaching a code of conduct and um, settle those maritime issue in South China Sea? Sure. Well, again, I, I want to be cautious from the State Department to speak to what the president's agenda uh, may be in South China Sea or in, in his trip to to Asia. I apologize. Um, but that said, you know, uh, and we've spoken to this before, is, you know, without saying it's necessarily going to be on the agenda at APEC, uh, you know, we're going to continue to talk to our partners and allies, as well as with China, and be very clear uh, about our uh, concerns uh, about the South China Sea uh, and, uh, you know, our position uh, and belief that uh, in freedom of navigation. Yes, sir, Michael. On Russia, uh, this is a different topic. Foreign Minister Lavrov said Russia is waiting to hear back from the State Department on a request to look into and intervene uh, regarding the health of jailed pilot Konstantin Yaroshenko, sure. who is suffering from severe heart pains. How are you handling this request? Um, so we have had, uh, you're talking about Konstantin Yaroshenko, right? Yes. Exactly. He was, uh, just for the benefit of the room, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison for conspiring to import uh, more than $100 million worth of cocaine into the United States. Uh, you know, we're obviously committed to meeting our obligations under uh, both international and domestic law for proper treatment of persons detained or incarcerated in the criminal justice system, and that certainly includes the provision of adequate medical care. Uh, we also ensure regular uh, consular access for jailed foreigners under the Vienna Convention. I know Russian consular officials have been into see Mr. Yaroshenko a number of times. I, I don't have the re most recent date. I can try to get that for you. Uh, I would refer you to the Department of Justice, but you know certainly we would uh, will respond to uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov's uh, concerns. Uh, did you get Did you get his request? I don't know yet. I would have to check on that. Uh, but you know this is, you know he is uh, uh, a foreigner held in the U.S. Uh, uh, justice system, uh, but you know we'll obviously pr continue to provide. Uh, whatever consular access is needed to him going forward. Burma. 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 Agreement on Burma? <laughs> okay. Can I ask a follow-up question regarding this individual? Is there anyone that the individual that uh, he, he beheaded, uh, was any American citizen among them? He says... Who are you see, talking about again? The, the guy that you designated. Okay. Uh, and according <laughs> to the announcement, so, okay, sorry, it says okay. that he was accused of beheading three individuals in Syria. Any one of them is American citizen. You're not talking. So you're not talking about Jihadi John, the person who. No, it's you're talking about the person who's designated. No. You know, I, I know somewhere in this huge book in front of me, I've got information about him. I just can't find it. So let me try to look for it after the briefing, and I'll give you whatever details I can. Okay. Ask if I may. Thank you. Sure. Uh, with the NLD victory in Burma, I realize it's very early days, but is there any discussion in this building or in, within the administration about further easing of sanctions? Uh, so, first of all, congratulate. We congratulate the people of Burma 
uh, on the election. We commend all of the people and institutions in the country who worked together to hold a peaceful and historic poll that allowed the people's voices to be heard. Um, you know, we understand uh, that the national, or rather the Union Election Commission is still releasing results, uh, but uh, as early results uh, trickle in, uh, we would congratulate the National League for Democracy on winning an absolute majority seat of seats in the Union Parliament and in state and regional parliaments. Um, with respect to uh, your specific question about uh, easing of sanctions, you know, this is a good and positive step. Uh, step uh, we're going to look for uh, and continue to assess uh, as Burma makes additional steps towards democratic reforms. So nothing certainly to announce today, but uh, you know, this is a, a step in the right direction. Please. Yeah. Question about uh, neighboring country, Cambodia. Yes. Um, do you, one, one quick thing. Yeah, go ahead. This is a step in the right direction in terms of the potential easing of sanctions? I just, just would say on, this, on the road to democratic reforms, additional democratic reforms that we're looking for, and um, but not previewing any decision we may make okay. on easing sanctions. Okay. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, Cambodia, remember. there was an arrest order for uh, opposition leader. Um, Right, yes. Um, Sam Ramsey. Sam Ramsey, exactly. thank you. <laughs> if you had a, I was well, wondering if you had a yep. response either in praise or in condemnation of this. Or uh, the United States is deeply concerned uh, about uh, the de deteriorating political climate in Cambodia in recent weeks. Uh, that includes assaults against two opposition lawmakers. Uh, and now, as you noted, the arrest of uh, a warrant against opposition leader Sam Ramsey. Uh, the timing of these charges gives the appearance of undue political influence in the judicial process. Uh, more broadly, the pattern of actions against the opposition suggests a return to the harsh political practices and tactics of the Cambo that the Cambodian people have made clear uh, they no longer want. So we're obviously monitoring the situation closely um, and calling on the Cambodian authorities to uh, drop the charges against Sam Rainsy. Going back to Burma. Uh, Go ahead, said the timing of these arrests or this? Timing of these charges. These charges. Okay, yes. thank you. Yep. Uh, uh, thank you, Mark. As far as this historic election is concerned in Burma, mm -hmm. uh, going back to 1990, 25 years ago, her party, Aung San Suu Kyi, had a landslide victory, but military stepped in and she was on and off in jail for 25 years. Don't you think now what this election means, democracy in limbo, because after military came in, they changed the constitution and they put certain restrictions uh, that it will be very difficult for her to rule and it might go back the same 25 years ago. So Correct. what the U.S. is doing as far as to bring full democracy so she can rule sure. as a prime minister or president of the country, which she does not have to see those uh, uh, cells so, or prisons yeah. again. So, Goyal, so we, we were, and in, in, in even leading up to the election, uh, very clear uh, that we had very, uh, that we had concerns rather about uh, some of the preconditions or some of the restrictions put on, uh, for example, as you noted, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's ability to uh, run as a candidate. Uh, and uh, uh, or, uh, or, or, or apply for the presidency, rather. Um, you know, those concerns remain. Uh, this is not, uh, uh, you know, a definitive step into democracy in Burma, but it's a step forward, we believe. And we're going to continue to urge uh, the government of Burma uh, to make continued progress uh, with democratic reforms, uh, with strengthening respect for and protection of human rights uh, and other fundamental freedoms, and addressing, uh, obviously, the situation in Rakhine State. Uh, so, you know, we're by no means uh, crossing the finish line, and Burma has a long way to go, uh, but we do view the elections as a positive step forward. Thanks, Mark. Yep. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks.